Welcome to Bristol Festival of the Future, City, part of the Bristol Festival of Ideas. We'd like to thank the Arts Council England, Innovate UK, Bristol City Council, and the University of the West of England who are responsible for supporting this conference, the Festival of the Future City. Um, if you want to tweet during this session, please use hashtag futurecity15. My name is Margaret Heffernan. I live just outside Bristol, even if it doesn't sound like it. And before this, I lived in two great cities, in Boston for eight years and in London for 24 years. I've just come back from Madrid, and before the month is out, I'll be in Basel and Dublin. As much as I love my rural retreat in Somerset, I have to acknowledge that cities are where it's at. In this first session today, we're going to be looking at some truly fresh thinking about what cities can be and about what they mean to people. Each of our brilliant panelists will speak for about eight to 10 minutes, and we'll hear from all of them before then opening it up for questions and discussion. First up is Charles Landry. Charles works with cities around the world. He's the chair of the European Capital Cities Innovation Award, and he's really interested in why is it that some places do better than others, even though they have the same resources. Charles. Hello, everybody. You all sound a bit quiet. <laughs> anyway, hello. Um, anyway, I'm just going to take you on a little journey, and I probably won't mention one city in these next nine minutes. But I've been thinking about why places succeed and fail for a long time. And I had the opportunity through an American foundation to look at Europe and ask that question, why do some places say it's not OK to be OK? And what are they and what are their characteristics? So I just want to go through what these features, qualities are and, get, uh, and project a sense of what that is. So firstly, what they do, these cities, these places, they recognize that conditions have really changed dramatically. They understand that and they realize that a business as usual approach will not get them to where they want to be. And they appreciate that the attitudes and attributes that might have made them great in the past might be precisely those that will make them fail in the future. So that sets something up. And then what they tend to do is they start with some sort of values, principles, whatever those may be. And we know some of the obvious ones they might say, like helping people the best they, to be the best they can be. That may be one principle. But they certainly start with values in a sense of a clarity of purpose. But these principles mustn't be too obvious as statements like, we want to be sustainable in an educated city. Did you want to be unsustainable and uneducated? <laughs> so it's got to have some drive in that message. And so therefore, there needs to be a sort of compelling narrative attached. And they assess, and this is important, they assess their situation um, realistically and honestly and overcome the power of denial, easily said than done. But this overcoming denial is really absolutely key to get going. And they are willing to seek help from the best, whatever the best means. But that means bringing in outsiders, listening to them, getting them to help analyze their situation, just so they can have a greater collective intelligence. And they're willing to engage with criticism. And as you know, most cities are not willing to engage with criticism and are willing to be unpopular in terms of doing a set of certain things. And they use crisis, because they all, most places are in crisis at some point, as an opportunity to try and do things and take risks and are even willing to get into competent failure. And they involve, obviously, people and organizations and sectors and all the things you can imagine. But especially what you note is they trust their youth and go with the grain of their enthusiasms. And in painting, as they begin to paint this bigger picture of themselves, they do it so broadly that everybody can find a place in this picture. And this picture, obviously, then, because it's broad, creates commitment and ownership, ideally. But it's got to find balance between not being too broad, so it's too vague, but also narrow enough so people can feel that there are projects in there for them to practically do. So that's an interesting balance. So they 
the leaders, if I can call them, it's never one leader, by the way, occasionally it is one, but then shortly after it's many, they have a trajectory, they show a trajectory, a journey, a direction, without being too specific, because they want to leave space for dialogue and co-creation in some sort of way. And that allows, obviously, different voices to come in. So they're not really part of this heroic version of city making, the hero who does it all. Um, because in the end, they know that to get things done, you have to build networks, teams, and all of those sort of things you know about. And in this process of this picture drawing and so on, they identify game changes and catalysts that can explain where, where they are going. Now, occasionally, there is a charismatic person who's in there at the beginning, but usually after a while, you find that they're either sacked, that often happens, they often get sacked and lose the next election, but they're trying to build a bigger team of people in order to make more things happen. And when they've got this bigger grouping, what you tend to find in a city is that confidence grows in order to challenge the accepted canon. And in order to do the changes we're talking about here, a hell of a lot of things need to be rethought. The way cultural institutions work, bureaucracies work, governments work, all of that needs to change, as we well know. Priorities need to shift, you know, vested interests who will tell you this is the tried and tested. All of that needs to be challenged. And in order to do that, there needs to be some sort of collective confidence. So that's why I'm saying it's not the charismatic hero or something like that. And this process obviously means, this confidence building process, is about daring to risk uncertainty and so on. But in essence, what they're doing, these places, is creating the conditions where people can think, plan, and act with imagination, where people, organizations, and the city as a whole can be and become the best it could be. I mean, that's simplifying the Creative City book in one sentence. Um, but that, I think, is partly true, that, that that's what they do. And so this atmosphere then often sees challenges or problems as opportunities in disguise. And in this process of doing things, they've obviously got to also do things that are successful and build confidence and stuff and get things done. And in order to do that, the public administrations in particular, and you know all this already, so I'm not telling you something you don't know, uh, shift from being less controlling to more enabling. And those entities trade power, the power that they have in theory, for creative influence. They realize that that actually achieves more, this mood, this atmosphere I'm trying to describe. And obviously within that process, activists and community people and so on, and critics find a space to come in because in a sense, this place that is confident realizes, hey, if we have a, more ideas, there might be more things that could happen. And in order to get the movement going, they think big, but start often small in order to build up incrementally in order to get the confidence for the big. So to simplify, they might have short, easy, cheap projects that build the confidence for the complex, difficult, more expensive projects and initiatives to happen. And of course, what they need to do in order to make this change process work, they go ironically or counterintuitively with the grain of their local culture. And going with the grain of their local culture is actually incredibly important. And whilst they might look to good examples from elsewhere, they don't imitate mindlessly. And in all of that together, they begin then to get some sort of clarity and sense of who they are and what their position is in a local, national, and obviously global sense, uh, global uh, context. And then they do all the things that we've heard about yesterday that you don't want me to talk about, which is obviously they build an evidence base and they do all that and say, we're doing that because of this, so you can go step by step, et cetera, et cetera, all of that. But you don't want to hear about that, from me at least. Um, so that obviously happens. So they're clever enough to be sort of quite visionary, let's say, but also quite grounded at the same time. And in that process, 
they begin to challenge in particular the idea of what is success and failure. And what is the criteria of various things? So is capital only financial capital? Is a project being done that might be financially okay but reduces social capital? They begin to introduce completely different ways of measuring stuff. And what you find is that the leadership groupings, these people, the city that collectively becomes more interesting, you see that these people have real passion, they have love, they talk emotionally, they're be willing to be emotional, they're willing to get beyond the sort of technical way of approaching cities. And that actually begins to keep the motivation going and makes you feel that the city is their vocation in some sort of sense. And clearly in that process, you get the feeling that these people are more in it, they're rather in the project, in the city, rather than above it, pontificating about it. So as they then narrow, uh, build this narrative of this story, which has some emotional drive in it, because you need that energy, because obviously things would otherwise just stay the same, they realize that you've got to be unorthodox at some point. And just doing the ordinary very well, and we need lots of ordinary things done well, like ordinary housing, is fine, and it needs to be beautiful or whatever else it needs to be, but you need to occasionally go further than that. And in order to do that, and since a lot of this is about inspiration, change in a city, you have to inspire at some level, uh, you have to find a way of communicating with simplicity, not too simplistically, but reasonably simply. And that means you have to really identify these catalysts and find emblematic initiatives that prefigure the future that you're trying to create. And so in short, and in summary, what happens is this overall approach that I'm talking about is these cities, they facilitate, they stimulate, but they also regulate, but when they're doing that, they're also infusing people. And that, when you, to end, I would suppose, what they do is they set aside vanity, their own vanity, going away from the hero version, so that the many can feel it's their job that they are doing. They are makers, shapers, co-creators of this emerging city. And so clearly they do all the stuff about partnerships and all that, which you don't want me to talk about. And finally, the most important thing for me is they find a way of orchestrating all these things together. And within that process of orchestration and bringing together, there is the role of the connector. And ask me about that later, because I don't want to talk about why I think the connector is so important. So that's my eight minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Charles, and never fear, we will put Charles on the spot and ask him to give us some real life examples later on. But I think it was really helpful to sort of frame some of the principles of these really thriving urban environments. Next, we have Mike Rawlinson. Mike is a design planner. He's the founding director of City ID. He works here in Bristol, as well as lots of cities around the country. And the crucial thing for Mike is really about how people engage with the city. Mike. Thanks very much. Um, I've changed the title on my presentation. Oops, which there is. <coughs> it was going to be a manifesto. I don't actually believe in manifestos per se. So actually, it's a, it's a work in progress. Um, and tomorrow it will be quite different from today in all probability. But without further ado. I want to talk about legible cities. Um, for the past 15 years, we've been working on uh, projects. I worked on Bristol 20 years ago as a legible city project. Um, but across the UK and uh, indeed now across the world, people are thinking about city legibility. That is basically, if we have architecture, we have urban design, we have all the physical aspects of city, but really how do people interact and interface with the city around them? How do we improve the user experience of places? How do we create things that enable them to understand and engage in exploring cities in different ways? And, you know, going back to people like Kevin Lynch that looked at landmarks, features and other things and defined the idea of legibility, today we live in a very digital world as well and actually how the digital uh, 
the Internet of Things meets the Internet of Place in particular is becoming really, really key in our minds. So um, without further ado, um, we're committed to the idea of public good and design for public good in public spaces. And um, we've worked on small projects, which is to kind of um, develop a public realm and movement framework for the city of Bath, the first time that's been done to create the canvas for public life in that city. And it led through to a whole kind of pattern language and series of design interventions. Things like uh, wayfinding systems, but public space design and other aspects, street furniture, uh, that are now in, in use in that city. All with the idea of promoting legibility, but promoting connectivity to people to place and actually rebalancing the city uh, with the idea that you create a canvas for more activity and more engagement uh, in, in its public realm. Um, We've also worked on the big. Now, we've not designed Red Square per se, <laughs> but, but we are helping develop a, a system for the city um, based on the idea of connecting all its forms of transport together. It has huge problems in terms of the legacy of the car uh, in Moscow. And what we've done is designed a visual identity expression to work across all modes of transport, but crucially puts the pedestrian uh, people at the heart of that experience. Uh, at every stage in the journey uh, from that. What we've done is engaged in, 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 with hundreds of different people in developing mental maps, in research and understanding the city. And there are repeating patterns emerge if you talk to people. And we've followed through to design the most detailed mapping that's ever been seen in, in Russia uh, for the central area of the city. And it's followed through to network diagrams right the way through to uh, quite grand projects working with the amazing metro system. The entirety of this, and this one aspect, is helping to move 9 million people a day. The equivalent of the population of Sweden is moving through that system. So it's a huge intervention. But legible cities really are about four things. Promoting identity, relaying the idea that design in cities is for people, expressing how we use cities through wayfinding, and linking together our forms of movement in cities. Um, Bristol, we worked on with a whole series of people and delivered 40-odd projects, and I want to show you some of the things that are ongoing. From everything from wayfinding to arts projects to new spaces and connections in the city. And kind of the first of these key principles for me is actually the idea of putting people first, uh, first and foremost. So the actual city itself starts to make sense to people. So legibility is about, a, it's a gluing concept, things that ties things together, it's a lens by which we experience a place. But we do that in a way, we design things that it's not just about universal person or universal man, it's actually designing with difference. We have to design different tools for different people with different abilities and different needs. From people that need to be guided directly, they just want to be shown where to go to others that actually want to explore and actually get lost in the city, which is a great thing to do, but they might want different tools, guides, the person guide or other things to do that maps, uh, websites, m mobile applications, all those sorts of things. So a legible city is the, is the sum of its parts, about small things adding up to a big idea. It's not about big architecture, big statements, but it's designing the everyday things that we come across in cities that collectively do make a massive difference to our experience. And some of those are obviously things like literal signs, uh, physical information systems that guide us, but also it's very important to design in subliminal messages, subliminal things that actually say it's here rather than there, that we centre design in the place we're designing for. So this idea of hereness is kind of number eight. It's about centering our design effort in creating something that's unique. Marc Auger talks about non-place, this idea that we live in very much a... a, a homogenised, ubiquitous environments, motorways, airports, rail stations, they broadly look dissimilar from one another, um, uh, similar to one another. So how do we design in a way that reflects the quality of the place that we, that we live in? How do we make Bristol feel different to somewhere else is the real key thing here. And what we're trying to do is trying to think about meshing both its image, its outward image, but also its cultural and physical identity together. And the cultural is very much about people and the physical is obviously about things around us. So Bristol, in many ways, is defined as being edgy and quirky, and that's actually quite interesting. It's something that you can't actually put in your pocket. It's almost beyond definition, and I think that's a very powerful statement for Bristol. It actually doesn't have to be uh, trying to reduce itself to being uh, the sustainable city, the green city. It can be many of the above and more, and I think that's part of its personality, that 
that comes through. And arguably, you know, the whole idea about cities is they must talk with provenance and authenticity. You cannot say what you're not. And um, I think it's very important that Bristol continues and strives in every different way to be both edgy, quirky and creative and crucially, uh, sorry, experimental. Experimental things are very important in cities. And legible city apart is the idea that things should work with the grain. You work with an identity of the city. Um, but at times, you want to go against that. You want to disrupt things. So working with the grain is things like um, designing streets and spaces so they connect together, promoting the idea of walkability and balancing the use of the car with the pedestrian and other modes of transport, and linking... Uh, walking routes to the river, for instance. They're all part of systems that are really important to our everyday experience. But the foil to that, in part, and this, is, again, is, is part of that language, how we rebalance Queen Square, for instance, uh, but also how we create that canvas, those spaces that start to connect together. So we can, rather than close streets, we can experiment and open them up to different activities. And this is not a legible city project, but... Um, it's Lucha, Lucha Ram, uh, Park and Slide. But the idea here from the Bristol of Past, which has said, let's create these monumental spaces, the rooms of the city, what we want to do now is not perhaps invest huge amounts of money, but just change them for a day or something. Change the expression of the city itself. And that's really very, very important. Um, so Legible City is more about a process than a product. It's actually... Uh, it's. It's broadly, it's an inductive process rather than a reductive process. Now, let's not pare everything down to its minimum. Let's open ideas up to expression. So it's broadly about saying, let's pose some questions before having answers. And it's fine to do that within a design process. But we find more and more of our clients just literally want the answer to something. They want another sign. They want another map. They actually don't think about what they really need or what people in their places really require of their user experience. So it's a, it's a problem. Um, that's partly why I'm against manifestos, because people pluck things out and just use them. Anyway, um, a legible city, and I think this is crucial in terms of the way Bristol's moving forward, it can start to harmonise some of these separate systems. And the best way of describing this is by showing you uh, what's happening publicly with the transit system. What we need to do is create a visual identity that does enough to pull the common parts of a transport system together so it makes sense whether you're walking, riding, cycling, using a bus system, they actually pull the visual identity of that together to make sense. So when you're walking and riding, you can use that system seamlessly. And it's not just that. It's actually saying that we need to make the networks that exist within the city, its bus networks, its movement networks, they're often invisible to people. When we did research in Bristol, People didn't actually understand the way transport works, where it goes, how you can cross the city, how you can in interconnect, how you can transfer. They're all really important things. So it's really important that we give legibility to very fundamental things like the transport network. But what we find is whenever the network gets too complex, people put a, a purple or a box in the middle and just say, please see the other side or please work it out for yourself. And it's a classic syndrome that we cannot design effectively that interface between products, information, and physical systems. So we, we've kind of been exploring this, and the idea of bringing sense and some sense of order to the centre of Bristol in terms of its transport, to actually define actually what the circuit is, the movement is, what you can do from each of the transport hubs. Now, these are basic things that they need to be introduced. Does the city have the ambition to do it is the real question. It's not a risk. It's about just doing everyday things as well as you can do, making the perception of the city as easy to assimilate for people as possible. And um, again, it follows through to, to absorbing that information at every point in the journey. So coming to the end, smart cities also need to be digital as well as analog. People go on about smart cities and the idea that technology will replace everything. It's not the case. We still have to design in an inclusive way and for everybody. But most of our platforms, most smart city platforms, will be digital. So it's really, really important, for instance, that we develop a visual language for the city that then can be used across different media and across, di across different channels. And this is part of the mapping system and mapping platform that's evolving for Bristol as an interface. Now, that can also be used for, uh, for 4G, for mobile, for web interface, 
for Wi-Fi as you enter the city and as you move through the city. Um, simple to use, using the same resources time and time again. It can follow through to things like a city dashboard, where you can have your city metrics, but also your journey planners, your air quality, all those sorts of measures can come through as a, as a city uh, a city platform and a city identity for, for Bristol. And it can follow through to signs, but also to print and through to a range of mobile and web devices. But it can also be customised by various different partners. So it's really important as well that cities are not designed as separate things, but they're designed as part of an ecosystem and that legible cities should be co-planned and co-designed. And that means understanding that, yes, we need to look at land use, we need to look at transport networks, pedestrian movements, and actually co-plan and co-design these, at least in terms of the, the way we build up ideas for things in order to unlock the idea of greater animation uh, in cities itself. Lastly, I want to think, uh, talk about just one thing, and that is the idea of what it means as a process and people that are delivering these sorts of projects. And it's the idea broadly that an urbanist arguably seen to, can be seen today as somebody that actually isn't just the planner, isn't just the engineer, uh, isn't just the poet that was mentioned yesterday, but somebody that can co-create, somebody that can curate different things, different events, different projects from long term to short term, that they can choreograph those and weave those and bring out a sense of order and a sense of place, but a sense of quirk and a sense of edginess, hopefully, for Bristol at the same time, if they let go and enable, if they understand what they have to systemise, but what actually they can let go and run, and what they can do to involve other people. And the last part is actually at some points in the process, in the design, we actually need to think of design as a concierge-based service. We do need to create a better sense of arrival, to meet and greet people, to do the basics in the city well. And it's really all the soft things, as well as the hard things, really matter in city design. And I'll say thank you very much at that point. That's great. Thank you, Mike. I love the difference that language makes. You know, it makes such a difference to think that Bristol's quirky instead of just odd, right? <laughs> quirky sounds exciting. Odd sounds mildly depressing. Um, next up, we have Melissa Sterry. Melissa is a scientist. She's also a designer. She's also an editor. She's also an academic. As you'd expect, she advocates a highly rich multidisciplinary approach to urban environments. Melissa. Good morning. Now, how do I get this device to bring my presentation up? There we go. I think this should do it. Hmm, presentation mode. Right. Um, Bionic City, it asks a question, how would nature design a city? There are many different ways in which we can explore that question, um, but I'm going to keep this brief and I'm going to get to really the crux of my research, the fundamental principles that drive the investigation into that question. We tend to see the future framed as the exponential expansion of the present, where we're told that trends, that which is about us today is, to all intents and purposes, going to get bigger. So we're going to have uh, more connected devices, we're going to have more technology, it's going to be faster, our supercomputers are going to get even more super, etc. What we have to understand about that is that sits within one particular ideological approach. It is, if you like, born of a philosophy, a very modern uh, Western philosophy, and there are different approaches. Since the Enlightenment, we've, sorry, since the Enlightenment um, and, if you like, Newtonian mechanics, we've been moving more and more towards this scenario in which we assume that we can control things. We assume that if we build it, they will come, and that is very much built into all of our systems. But if you start looking into complex systems, which some perceive as being a modern science, particularly because this past couple of decades we've seen a lot of really notable tomes. Uh, as I will reference shortly, it's actually a very ancient uh, science. But the approach that I take is very different in that 
I don't see the, the future as the exponential uh, expansion of the present. And to quote a well-known uh, US um, political figure, I conceive of it as the knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Because historically, that which has really, if you like, taken the carpet from under humanity, it wasn't what we were expecting. It wasn't those scenarios that we planned for. It was that which we didn't. And if we look at our own lives, we all set out, I, I love lists, I make lots of lists, and I have every intention when I make them to explicitly follow those lists. But invariably what happens is that I have to think on my feet because things don't quite pan out as I expected, and this happens to humanity. And the particular scenario that I'm looking at uh, with respect to these complex systems is natural disasters. Until several years ago, I was working as a multidisciplinary practitioner across a number of different disciplines, but generally within sus sustainability, you could, you could call me a bit of a jack of all trades, and at one moment I'd be working on fashion project, the next I'd be working on a product design project, etc. But, you know, I got to my mid-30s and I thought, I'm at the point of life when if I'm going to make a major career change, then this is it, you know, this is, this is the sort of last chance saloon. And I thought, well, I've got a really low boredom threshold, so I need something pretty spectacular. What is the biggest sustainability challenge that we as human beings are going to face, in my opinion, from what I've seen? And I concluded it was the problem of cities in the face of extreme geological and meteorological hazards, because that was what all the data I was seeing in terms of how climate change and its various different facets will manifest. And within the context of um, nature, I decided to take a look at how ecosystems respond to major natural hazards. The reason being that obviously throughout time, the reason we're here is because of a series of truly catastrophic mass extinction events which were triggered by geological and meteorological shifts that weren't such that it was just a regional regime shift. In, in other words, we went from one state to another. It was a global regime shift. So we know that life over the 3.8 billion years of its known existence has persistently adapted. And not only has it adapted, it's improved. There are a lot of um, major natural hazards that one can look to, but one in particular that I um, use within my, re my research is the Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980, which is significant on a number of different levels. This was one of the biggest natural hazard events in the states in modern times. It can be quantified by the fact that its energy release was equivalent to 20,000 Hiroshima bombs. The, um, the plume, the eruption plume, uh, went up to about 80,000 feet. The speed of the uh, pyroclastic flow, the explosion, was nearly at the speed of sound. Some scientists even uh, speculate that it might have reached the speed of sound. It reached, uh, you know, it, it reached such intensity of heat that it, in the style of Vesuvius and Pompeii, it, it, it absolutely obliterated the immediate vicinity. There was nothing left. Everything was blown out of the immediate vicinity. Four million board uh, timber, sorry, four million feet of board timber of forest was immediately felled. There was the biggest landslide on record uh, in the States, lahars, mud flows, and what have you. So uh, from a geological perspective, this was very, very significant. But it was significant in other respects in that this was one of the first major televised natural hazards in the world. And I remember seeing this as a child and being absolutely mesmerized watching this live event being beamed out um, thinking it was very scary. I'd had no idea that eruptions could, could take on this scale. And um, they're in sort of slightly in awe in the same way that the ancients would have been in awe and, and fearing that the gods had been angered and, and were uh, expressing that by punishing humanity with this catastrophic, catastrophic event. But um, what is most interesting about this event, uh, if like me you're looking at ecosystems, is the fact that this today comprises the most comprehensive ecological study of a post-natural disaster um, system. And there have literally been a team on the ground uh, at this site, which is now a national park, following every single step of the recovery. So up in the top corner up here, you can see what looks like heather. They're actually um, alpine lupins. And these little fellas were popping up within three months of this catastrophic 
eruption, this area that had been completely cleared, completely decimated, nothing but ash, they had started the recovery process. They are what are called pioneer species. And they um, had persisted because their root system was intact underground. Indeed, there were mammals down there. There were alpine, sorry, there were, there were gophers down there that just happened to be burrowing below the surface. And these were a couple of the species that got the ecosystem going. I've looked at all manner of different ecosystem scenarios around the world and I found there are these pioneer species in all ecosystems. And what happens is that having, if you like, made it somewhat more um, hospitable, we then see other species move in. And they move in through a, a variety of different systems that are operating both at the local, the regional and the global scale from in indigenous species to migratory species. And so I looked at this system that was taking effect and I overlap that with complex systems theory. And here we have that theory summarized. So down here, you can think of this growth as spring. This will be the month of spring in the season. And this is when we see, uh, you know, it's budding. Economically, this would be the period shortly after a major economic collapse when we see startups, we see disruptive businesses. It all gets really exciting. We're pretty much in that period still at this moment after the major collapse of uh, the late noughties. But then over time, the ecosystem becomes more established until we get to what is summer. This is, this is peak growth. This is uh, the stock market is booming. You're making lots of profit. Thank you very much. We're all feeling very safe. But then, invariably, this is chaos theory manifesting here, remember? Boom. We've got our 20,000 Hiroshima bomb event going off. And actually, if you look um, at the energy release, and if you, if you quantify um, major natural hazards in terms of the likes of thermodynamics, then you really start to get um, a, a handle on what we're actually dealing with here. You know, then when people start to say to you, well, actually, we can, we can, you know, we can mitigate major natural hazards in cities. You know, we can basically uh, use all these different technologies to override these events. You know, you, you look at the statistics, you review that, and then you look at the technologies and, and see what you think of it. My assessment is you've got to be kidding if you think you can stop all this stuff. Um, so then we have our major, you know, we have, this is called release. This is the release event. But then what's effectively happened, and this is exactly what happens in an economic collapse, is we've got, in the aftermath of this catastrophe, we've got an abundance of materials. So, you know, in, you could think in an economic catastrophe, this would be empty buildings. This would be all those places on the high street that are now, you know, have got pop-up shops and charity shops and all sorts of organisations there that wouldn't be there at the height of the, the peak conservation uh, period. So we get a reorganisation of resources, very, very exciting. And then we get to the regrowth again. So we've got our spring, summer, autumn, winter scenario, but panning out on a huge scale, panning out over um, you know, years, decades, centuries. If you look at complex systems, you'll see this looping through. You'll, you'll start to, to recognise it both in our systems, historical systems, and so on. So stripping that back, what have we got going on here? Well, my belief is that within natural ecosystems, we have polarity. We have light death, uh, sorry, we have light and dark. We have life and death. Um, we have uh, immaterial and we have material. And right now, our, our um, ideological approach here in the West, I might say, it's not universal, it's very material. We're very much about everything that's built. You know, we put a lot of value on that, particularly in Britain. A man's home is his castle. But some interesting things are going on because actually now we have all sorts of means and ways of exploring the immaterial. So think about downloadable lifestyles. Think about the sharing, caring community. <coughs> there was a time when, you know, when you moved into a new home, you'd go out and you'd buy a new set of power drills because you had a shelf to put up and then your power tools would sit in the drawer or in your garage for about five years. A neighbour might borrow them, but essentially they and a whole load of other stuff was taking up clutter. With today's younger generation increasingly um, wider demographics, they don't do that. They're smarter than that. They share, you know, and there's all sorts of platforms that facilitate that. So this is an immaterial material juxtaposition. It's, it's a, a scenario in which we're shifting. We are regime shifting from one thing unto another. 
And I think this is particularly interesting at the city scale because I think that this really opens up a lot of ideas that have, in fact, they've been littered through the, the history of um, city theoretical uh, research and, and conceptualization, ideas that for centuries have been talked about, but the, the creators of those theories were not endowed with that which we have today. You know, so they interpreted their fundamental beliefs with what, what was around them. But if you, if you look at the narratives and you start to interpret it with, with, with what we have, you start to think, well, actually, you know, were Thomas More, for sake of argument, were he alive today, he might have thought, well, yes, I, I fundamentally believe in these values, but I'm not going to express them in that particular physical way. I'm going to do something very exotic by comparison. And just to give you one example of how this might manifest today, there was a time when if you were uh, wanting to buy property, you would rely on a developer. You would go to a bar at home or another big company and you'd buy a property. And of course, what's happened is properties become more and more expensive and you know, there's a very big conversation today about young people not being able to afford property. But the point here is that you don't have to do that now. And most of the most interesting property development companies that I know of, they're not actually building um, homes per se. What they're doing is they're creating a kit of parts they're doing the, the likes of WikiHouse, which we have here, which is a downloadable plan for a house. It's adaptable. It's very basic, but this is essentially a new startup. So, you know, they've, they've done what Charles was talking about. They've kept the idea simple, and then we can make it more complex and sophisticated over time. They da you can download your plan for your house. You can build it yourself, like you would build your IKEA set of drawers. But there are other folks that are looking at this, and they're looking at really interesting things, like you uh, buy one module that suits you as a you know, hip single person. Then you have a family, so you add, you add a bit on. And then your family expands, so you add a bit more on. But then your kids leave home, so you can actually sell off a bit of your modular home. So you've got a completely adaptable property. So it is material, but it's interfacing with this immaterial construct. And there are lots of ways we can facilitate that. So I've talked about the, the, the fact that we here in the West have got a very, um, actually a very biased outlook on the world. If you've traveled a lot, if you've you know, traveled across to Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, if you have an interest in different belief systems, it might be Taoism, it might be Buddhism, any ancient belief systems, you will, you will realize just how different, how we generally think today is from our predecessors and from some other peoples around the world. What I find absolutely um, really heartwarming and inspiring about um, humanity is that in looking back to our very most ancient texts, looking back to the most universal of symbols and um, ideological concepts, concepts of things that we were talking about, um, not within a particular pocket of humanity, but, ac but across different continents, we see that actually our forebears were very sophisticated thinkers. They absolutely understood complex thinking. They absolutely understood regeneration and this system here that I've been talking about, panicky, one of the various different complex systems theories of the last uh, few decades. They express that in a great number of different ways. They express, express it in numbers. The number eight up there, this is an ancient symbol of infinity. And it's not just unique to one culture, but to many. And you will see that this diagram here was not created because it looked like an eight, because it had a direct reference to the number eight. It was, it was the way in which the, uh, the, 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 the uh, concept was expressed mathematically. Okay? So this was something that, that technically worked, but it just happens, happens that the ancients made that connection. We're talking thousands of years ago. We're talking at least several thousand years ago. And we also see it expressed in other things. We can express it seen at the, the, the uh, cosmic level. You know, we can see the sun. Here we've got the pattern of the sun throughout the year, the way that it loops around the sky. If you were to put it on a, um, you know, if you were to, to photograph the different positions, it just also happens to loop on an eight. Again, the ancients spotted this. They were very much aware of the different movements of the planets in the solar system um, and these much, much bigger, grander scale events. So my research is very much rooted in the midst of all these different concepts. And the fact of the matter is that obviously it is highly theoretical. 
Um, it's a not, it's, you know, I'm not doing this for profit. I'm not doing this because I've got a big corporation and I want to make loads of money. I'm doing it because it's interesting and because I think it's important. And I think that if we're actually going to think about what the future city might look like, we have got to step back and we've got to realise our inherent prejudices. We've also got to be very humble and we've got to realise that actually modern man hasn't necessarily got all the answers. We're not necessarily as smart as we think. It pays to listen to different cultures. And when you go to the table, don't think, well, actually, your nation's really poor um, and you, you know, you don't have um, all the sort of smart, fancy technologies that we've got um, and you're not, therefore not sophisticated because especially in this domain, and this is my finishing point, um, when I've looked to the countries of South and Southeast Asia, now these, these areas have been hit by natural hazards time and time again for as long and, and way before records began. They actually, within their inherent architectural systems and their inherent uh, community structures and belief systems, they have resilience. They have immense resilience. Nations like Indonesia, the Philippines, India, it blows us out of the water, to be frank, you know. And yet we have a scenario at the moment where we have a lot of experts from the West assuming that we have, we are, you know, we are the gods, we've got all the, all the know-how, telling these folks how to do their business. And the worst thing is when you've got vested interests behind this. You've got people tr who basically want to flog stuff. You know, then we're getting into issues not only of ideology and philosophy, you know, but we're getting into issues of um, human well-being and everything that is, is con connected unto that. So I hope that, uh, hope that gives you some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Food for thought, indeed. Next, we have Bradley Garrett. Bradley actually came through the door today, but he generally breaks into places. He's, he's known as a place hacker. He's written two fabulous books, one, Explore Everything, and the other, Subterranean London. He's interested in lots of the parts of the cities that we don't even think about, seeing every city as a puzzle that needs its pieces put together in order to connect things. Bradley. Thank you very much for the introduction, Margaret, and thank you to all of you for being here this morning. Um, so I'm a, I'm a social geographer at the University of Southampton. I'm uh, yeah, normally a, a professional trespasser interested in um, how people make connections to places, and particularly places that are off limits to us. Uh, but I'm also a columnist for Guardian Cities, where I write about public and private space, and that's the, that's the hat that I'm going to be wearing this morning. And the idea that I want to put forward this morning is, is very simple. It's a single idea. And that idea is that the, uh, the public, space is, uh, public space in cities is disappearing. We're losing public space. We spend a great deal of time, money, and energy thinking about uh, you know, how to build cities, how to design cities to, to satisfy various stakeholders. And in doing so, um, I think part of the problem here is that we imagine the city as a product rather than a process and importantly, a process that, that we as citizens are a part of. And that product increasingly is ending up in the hands of a, a corporate elite who very often aren't even citizens of the cities that they own, which I think is very problematic. The almost total saturation of post-Thatcherite neoliberal ideologies has led to the deployment of an urban realm that is safe, uh, it's, it's clean, and it's utterly boring. It's something that we're not invested in anymore. And so um, I'd like to suggest that, that you know, cities that are being built and rebuilt are very often being built now to be, to be bought into temporarily and not to be participated in. I think that's something that needs to be changed. This of, this, of course, has been happening over the past 20 years increasingly. And um, in the past, I think that there were more conciliatory nods made to the public uh, in, in terms of negotiation about how space was going to be built. Um, but infrastructures today, uh, you know, these are part of our public spaces, public infrastructures and also open air public spaces, uh, are increasingly being uh, sold off to private companies and sold out uh, from underneath us. And very often that's happening without public consultation. One of the most important examples, I think, and, and if you were at the session last night with, with Ian Sinclair and Matthew Beaumont, he discussed this, 
Uh, one of the most important examples, I think, is, is the land around uh, City Hall in London, which was actually sold off in 2014 to a Kuwaiti investment firm for 1.6 billion pounds in one of the largest land deals in UK history. There was no public consultation on this, sa on this sale. And that area is now owned by a company. This is open air space out front of City Hall. This, this land is now owned by a company called More London. And More London, because they are a private company and they uh, own that space, they can regulate what can happen in that space, even if what they want to happen contradicts the law of the land. So More London uh, can actually stop you from filming, taking photos, congregating in groups of more than three, napping, picnicking, loitering, and of course protesting, which, is, which should be deeply disturbing to us, that we can't actually mount a protest outside of the capital, outside of City Hall. So um, last year there was actually an instance of, of someone from City Hall, a government official, trying to do a television interview outside of City Hall in open air space, and they were told by a security guard from Moore London that they couldn't film there without a permit. You know, what does this tell you about who is control of, who's in control of our cities, right? It's, it's like we've reached a new state in, in, in neoliberal capitalism where the government isn't even a stakeholder anymore. This is incredibly disturbing. So another example, of course, is the Garden Bridge, uh, of which there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, and uh, the Garden Bridge, you know, initially was proposed as something that was going to be funded by private corporations. And eventually that proposal slightly shifted and now suddenly we're going to be investing 60 million pounds of taxpayer money in the construction of this bridge, which is going to be closed to cyclists. It's going to be closed at night. Uh, groups of more than three will have to register to use the bridge. And it's going to be closed a month of every year for private functions. Uh, there's also a three and a half million pound a year upkeep on this bridge. This is all coming out of the public purse at, at, and ostensibly during an age of austerity. Um, at this point, even Lambeth Council has pulled out of backing this project, yet it continues to march forward. What is going on <laughs> with our cities? Who is in control of this planning? It's time to admit, I think, that we've, we've lost the war against the wankers and pinstripes. They, they, they own the city. It, it's done. And the only option left I'd like to suggest, and here I'm going to put my trespasser hat back on, <laughs> is that participatory urban occupation is uh, the only way that we can, we can take back our city. And we need to be as dismissive of the neoliberal city as it is of us. Building future cities that matter to citizens, cities that are constituted of places rather than spaces, is more than a question of demanding access to urban space. And it's more of a question of, of um, reclaiming the city in a way that is meaningful, that changes the fabric of the city. And importantly, I don't think this is something that we should ask permission to do. I don't think that we should wait to be consulted on these issues. I think that we should take control of the city by force, if necessary. So David Harvey no uh, notes, he's a geographer, notes that the freedom to make and remake our cities and ourselves is one of the most precious yet neglected of our human rights. And as such, the most f a crucial form of protest available to us as urban inhabitants is simply the denial of corporate power over space and the reimagining of space where, where common, poor, migrant, minority bodies can occupy sp city spaces as an embodied politic, not in resistance to, but despite political, social, and legal expectations. What I'm suggesting here is that if we want cities to be more than sites of tourism and business. We must begin building in a more than meta metaphorical sense. The linchpin here is, is the abandonment of this notion of permission. None of us need permission from anyone to participate in our cities, regardless of who owns them, regardless of whether it's public or private space. And I think that you know London, as the sort of epicenter of, of where these conversations are taking place, you know, it will likely have a financial future. It will have a financial future as a place where the rich can park their money in speculative real estate investments and artists can make money off of even more speculative crappy public art. All of that is going to take place. What is that question here in my mind is whether London, and it follows other British cities, have a cultural future. You know, who is going to be investing in these cities, especially when 
citizens of cities, the people who have invested in these cities, uh, um, are increasingly being pushed to the margins. We're being pushed out of the cities that we live in. Um, as <laughs> there, was, there was a person in the audience last night at, at Ian Sinclair's talk, I don't know if you're in the audience tonight, but someone made a brilliant point. Uh, he said that we're supposed to be in the recipe, but we've become the garnish. <laughs> that was actually a beautiful rendering of this idea. Um, so with all, all of this in mind, I, I just wanted to say something about public space protection orders. Um, can I just get a show of hands? How many people are aware of PSPOs? That's incredible. Okay, very few people. So public space protection orders came into effect last year under the Antisocial Behavior Crime and Policing Act. Um, and uh, if you remember ASBOs, which have now been repealed, antisocial behavior orders. So essentially, PSPOs have replaced ASBOs. We thought ASBOs were going away because we all objected to them. Uh, they were obviously targeting specific groups of people. Very often, they targeted the vulnerable and the weak. So PSPOs are essentially an ASBO, which is geographically defined. So the council can map out um, an area over a space, and within that area, they can ban particular activities from taking place. They can make those activities criminal, even though those activities wouldn't normally be criminal. So uh, these have been used around the UK to criminalize public speaking, sleeping rough, and even walking dogs without leads. Dover City Council recently passed that. Um, PSPOs, like ASBOs, uh, they are dangerous because they unfairly target the weak, the poor, and the vulnerable in our communities and because they're a way of criminalizing non-criminal behavior, what is normally non-criminal, without going through the proper democratic channels. So I hope you can see the relationship here between uh, the public buy-off, uh, the private buy-off of public space and the institution of these PSPOs, because what I found in my, in my investigations about PSPOs for The Guardian is that very often the councils don't even want them, right? There's, there's a corporation, very often, who is the b behind the redevelopment of an area, who's pressuring the council to put these PSPOs in place to, as one of them put it, tidy up the city in preparation for regeneration. So I had a look to see whether there was a PSPO planned for Bristol, and indeed there is. Uh, I came across a planning document, yes, uh, put together by Stuart Pattison, the crime reduction manager at the council, and two days ago, Stewart held what he called an inquiry day uh, to, quote, look into more detail at how partners can use these and other tools and powers to best tackle antisocial behavior in Bristol's parks and green spaces. So let me parse that for you. Stewart is consulting with corporations to figure out how to stop you from drinking tins in the park and walking your dog. <laughs> That's essentially what's happening now. Um, you know, given that these uh, powers are supposedly about making cities safer, don't you find it interesting that his consultation wasn't with the Bristol public? Right? That always comes after the fact. The thing's already being put in place, and then they ask for comment on it. Those comments almost never derail the proposal. Uh, they did in Hackney last year, interestingly, and there's a good case study there that we can chat about if you want to. Um, now, this document wasn't exactly waving on a flagpole. It took me a bit of digging <laughs> to find that, th that this was out there. And if you didn't know exactly what to Google, you wouldn't find this document. And it seems to me that the most contested battleground of our time is really over access to and control of information. You know, if we don't have this information, we can't act on it. And we can't make decisions as a community if we don't know what's going on. So we've seen these issues play out in cyberspace, where governments and citizens feud over how much transparency is required in a democracy. But as a geographer, I want to make it clear to you that these battles are also taking, spa taking place in space, right, in, in cities around us, that moves are being made to control your voice, your rights, and your mobility. Um, and I find that uh, particularly troubling where private companies are now taking control of public infrastructures and public space. And that's not going to be reversed anytime soon. As I say, I think we've lost that battle. So perhaps in that light, I don't want to leave you on a down note, I think that you know, technology, perhaps, turning these technologies that are distracting us and in some ways enslaving us to, to our own ends is one way that we can try and help the situation by doing the citizen journalism necessary, taking those uh, phones and cameras and our computers out into the city and recording what's happening, finding all of those tiny posts on signs and recording them and posting them online and starting a discussion about what's going on there. You know, that is one way we can raise awareness. 
But I think we have to take it beyond that, right? We need to take this to the streets and use our old analog tools of screwdrivers and paint cans <laughs> and go out and start reclaiming the city in a very physical sense. Uh, and in doing so, we deny the city being sold to us at a premium and potentially start working towards rebuilding a city that is built by public hands. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bradley. Well, before we all grab our screwdrivers, um, I hope we'll stay to listen to Irena Bauman. Irena is a practicing architect. She's looking for practical solutions to make cities and the humans who live in them more resilient. Irena. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I couldn't have wished for a nicer presentation to take over from. And in fact, all the presentations um, because what I was hoping to capture is some kind of summary of everything that we've discussed. Uh, I'm, I, I love ideas, but they're also very practical. And what strikes me about the things uh, that, w that Charles was talking about, that we all actually know, we all roughly know what is wrong at the moment and where we should be going. But the biggest question is, you know, who is going to do it and how are we going to get there? So I always like to start from what we actually got at the moment. And what is happening at the moment is that the kind of you know, the, uh, horrendous scenarios that we are portraying uh, as post-apocalyptic uh, uh, ideas in our films, some which is very far away, uh, this is Hunger Games, of the city which has everything, that's the capital, and every excess you can possibly imagine, and the rest of the population lives in 13 districts which are roughly underground, and extremely impoverished. Well, these uh, apocalyptic, apocalyptic scenarios exist already. You know, Los, Los, uh, uh, Las Vegas uh, very famously recently started discovering that people are living in the sewers because the price of land has become so expensive they can't afford the housing. And of course, here, mm. um, in the nearest city to us that um, is clearly showing the direction of current travel. London, the, the skyline has changed in the last seven years. This, you know, those two photographs are seven years apart. So I don't think there's any doubt about who is controlling the business of, uh, as usual. You know, it is a handful of extremely powerful people who have political power as well as financial power. And in Melissa's uh, adaptation cycle diagram, you know, I wish we were in release uh, phase. We are not in release phase. We are in conservation phase. And that conservation phase is holding on as tightly as they possibly can to business as uh, usual. They are dictating everything that we are doing at the moment. And very few people are getting uh, very, uh, very, very wealthy. And of course, we know from everything, you know, from all, uh, all history, uh, that that will lead sooner or later to enormous social unrest. So all the way through this festival, because I was here um, yesterday, which was absolutely fascinating, uh, there are two wicked problems that keeps reoccurring in all, you know, in, no matter how different representations are, they keep cropping up. One is the rapid, rapid growth of unequal distribution of everything. It's not just uh, wealth, it's also work, of course, and housing and many other things. And the other wicked problem is inadequate governance structures. We don't know who is going to fix it and how we can possibly tackle such huge issues. Because one of the greatest natural haz hazards I wanted to say to Melissa is, of course, humankind. Not, uh, we, we have created this very difficult natural conditions. So the, the, you know, the, the actual challenge is you know, how to, the, the really big challenge, if I was to summarize it in eight minutes, I think, is to break this incredible cycle that uh, you were talking about uh, of no self-feeding um, uh, establishment. Uh, and I don't quite agree with you that the only way is to be uh, uh, anar uh, an anar anarchist because uh, there are other ways that people are beginning to experiment wi with which are probably more resilient and they can last longer. And one of the ones I want to suggest today is um, at a local level, you know, where everybody can participate and not with the city council as the enemy, quite the opposite, as the city council as an essential collaborator with its own people and the two sort of clapping together, you know, the, the top-down, so-called top-down and bottom-up, finding a way of synchronizing the, uh, the wishes and the ambitions. And uh, Henrietta Moore, who is a fantastic anthropologist, said quite recently on the radio that 
in development, we no longer have certainty of outcomes. Instead, we are working with partial knowledge, experimentation, and collaboration. And this, you know, this idea that we only work with partial knowledge is so powerful. You know, you, Bristol has put this incredible festival on. It is just breathtaking what you've done here. And that's the city council, of course, with, with uh, stakeholders and supporters. Uh, and you're collecting all these amazing ideas. But in the end, even with that huge effort, we, it'll only be partial. It'll only, can end that, uh, only be partial. So experimentation and collaboration have become very important parts of uh, how we uh, deal with the current situation. And as Charles said, you know, we, we will be failing quite a few times, but there's a lot to be learned from failure. So I just want to talk about three examples, which I think are beginning to point towards kind of resilient way of working uh, uh, w with communities directly and local authorities. Um, and there are different ways of achieving it. The first one is Copenhagen Climate Quarter, which is a top-down, it's a, it's a you know, city initiative, uh, but at the same time, it's empowering local people. So uh, Copenhagen is reacting to a cloud-based event in 2011 when the whole city was drenched you know, up to hip height with, with, with a flood. Uh, it was a big shock. The government gave 44 million coronas immediately the next day to the city to start thinking about how to adapt to climate change. And they are now using it as a great opportunity to retrofit many other things. So while they're changing the entire infrastructure to be able to cope with um, the, f uh, the, the cloud burst that we are anticipating, they are also finding new ways of in engaging the uh, local residents in all the decisions making about how this is going to be designed and also rewriting legal documents. There's a lot of legal work uh, happening there about changing the contract between the city and its citizens and the relative powers to the kind of things that, uh, that you were talking about, about who's got the right to public realm and also responsibilities and who is going to be uh, animating that space and loving it and using it. The other uh, very, very interesting experiment or, 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 or trend in Berlin is actually bottom-up. It's a middle-class bottom-up, and that's quite often put up as some kind of uh, thing to be embarrassed about. I don't think it is. No, middle classes are more resilient. No, we've got more fat uh, around us. And you know that famous uh, re requirement on a plane to put your oxygen mask on your face before you help your child, which is so counterintuitive. Actually, no, if, the, if we don't have resilient uh, people around us, we won't be able to solve some of the play, uh, problems ahead. So this particular bottom-up uh, initiative of, uh, of self-made projects started in Berlin in the 80s when the city uh, unified and it was going through a massive recession and a lot of young people were out of work, a lot of creative people were out of work, uh, architects, and they went about trying to redefine how a city could be built. A lot of uh, architects initiated projects where they uh, approached uh, groups of young of, of, of people who wanted to live uh, collectively or in some form of uh, cooperative living and created uh, over 200 projects in the city uh, where people which people built uh, on those principles of co uh, uh, of co uh, cooperation and those projects are very different from other housing schemes now you can see you can walk into every single one of them and you know that the values of the people who build them are different from standard values. They have a lot of public space. The public space is not gated. It's open to the rest of the city. Some of the most commercial elements of the uh, projects, the roof space, for example, are usually given over to collective ownership, not to individual uh, ownership. And there are very interesting structures of ownership which don't allow the property to become uh, a commodity. Uh, there are so many of these projects, what's so interesting about Berlin, that there are so many of these projects now, there's such a critical mass, that they are, no, they, this movement is becoming much more ambitious. And they have now, one, one uh, cooperative has now purchased one of the most expensive sites in Berlin on the, on the south bank of Berlin. And they are now proposing a very different development there, which will be co-produced with the uh, general public, and also they are protecting the main stretch of the front for public use. So they are becoming very vocal and they are negotiating with the city, with the planners, what it is that should, you know, what development should be allowed to happen in the city, what kind of criteria, what kind mm. of value do they add to the city, uh, not only financial ones. Uh, the last example I want to give you is actually happening here in England, 
up north, it's not just cities, it's also towns. We mustn't forget that a lot of good ideas come from towns, not just big cities. And there's an idea there which you have here or, uh, in Bristol already of incredible uh, edible movement where pro small production of food uh, at the neighborhood level is, is connected to upskilling and learning and then connected to enterprise. So there's a local cycle of uh, economy that develops around, ver uh, around very small initial moves of simply planting some food. And this is the kind of um, uh, circular economy uh, that uh, Incredible Edible are trying to establish, taking leftover space in the city, in a town, uh, a little bit of guerrilla tactic there, starting to produce food, create a, com a sense of community around it and learning and then turn it into uh, 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 enterprise. And there are plenty of these, there are 125 of these projects now internationally. You have one here, of course, in uh, Bristol as well. It has mm -hmm. now become a network. And the original um, uh, organizers uh, want to scale it up. And I'm, I'm, I'm involved in this now, we're setting up a new company. Uh, th th there's something about food which seems to connect absolutely everybody. It's uncontroversial. You know, Copenhagen have started this, uh, Paris is doing some amazing things around uh, food and those kind of circular co economies. Uh, and the originators of Incredible Edible Movement are now suggesting that we should create Incredible Northern Greenhouse. And we are actually doing it. And the idea is to connect all of north of England, which Joseph Randley, uh, Randley last, uh, uh, yesterday described uh, uh, very clearly, is the most horrendous area of uh, continuous deprivation, which just doesn't shift. You know, it has not shifted in four, 40 years. Uh, and the upscaling involves getting, um, g getting the key anchor stakeholders in the cities and towns involved, and that means you know, universities, hospitals, prisons. We are going to work with some prisons as well. So creating connection between city governance, uh, local communities, and those key anchor, uh, anchor institutions in, uh, in communities. And we have to watch the space. Uh, we are basically trying to re really re redefine what prosperity means. I think this is how big the task is. And maybe uh, very simply use this diagram, which very succinctly explains that the you know the fulfillment, personal fulfillment, does not l lie in increased amount of consumption. In fact, we know that that sense of happiness from having things uh, uh, becomes very uh, ceases to be to, to increase. It actually starts decreasing when we have too much consumption uh, and luxury and, uh, and extravagance. So really the question for all of us and for Bristol is you now how can we uh, redefine prosperity? Thank you. Right, so I'd like to ask all of our speakers to please to come and um, sit on the stage. I've got a couple of quick questions, but really I'm very eager to get the questions from the audience. So if you could join us now, please, that would be terrific. So, Charles, of course, I have to ask you, having outlined all those fantastic principles of really resilient, creative cities, um, can you give us an example? Well, I think you can rethink many things. Let's just, because you were talking about democracy in some sense. Um, in uh, Turin, I just saw recently the Biennale of Democracy, as distinct from the Biennale of Art, mm. as distinct from the Biennale of Design. And I just think that's mm. quite an interesting small example. Uh, another example, sorry, the examples would add up in theory. Uh, Eindhoven, the worst area of drugs, prostitution and stuff like that. Schools had to close, etc., etc. The Social Housing Corporation, which was run by a very interesting person, who runs something called Stripe S, said, how can I generate a game changer? And he knew there were a lot of young people around, university was relatively near. He said, OK, I'll do a deal. I'm not really allowed to give you these buildings, houses uh, to live in cheap, but I will. I'll, and he, he wasn't allowed. But he gave the buildings to students cheap, but they had to have a deal. They had to commit themselves to spending 20 hours a month minimum with the younger people in that area who were completely disengaged and so on. So the school that had to be closed, that was then reopened, 
because it was just, you know, it was drug dealing outside of it. Four years later, this school, through this intervention of what was 180 students who moved into this area, 180 times 20 hours, etc., etc., changed the school to be apparently the best in the province of two million people. So that's another example. Mm. A third example could be Malmo, which is trying to develop a new form of planning, which has a it's called dialogical planning, it doesn't matter what, but the main point about it is that you're not sort of just going straight in a line, right. you're being strategically principled and tactically flexible. Um, Rotterdam, oops, sorry, everything's falling down, that's good, <laughs> that's fine, I'm just, that's fine, just let, leave it all me, there. Let me stop you there, because I think... Anyway, there's lots of examples yeah, that go exactly. on and So I think what's really interesting here is this sort of tension between organic development and thoughtful design, and the kind of both the, the creative tension and the political tension between those things. Um, we could all carry on talking about this forever, but I'd really like to hear from the audience in terms of what your questions are, please. If you don't have any, I'll just keep asking questions. Yeah. I've got one, I've got a question for Lisa. I have a question for Melissa, and I thought your, your talk was um, fascinating and uh, linked so closely to interests of mine. I'm an author of books on urban design and planning. One thing, and also on participatory placemaking, one thing I'd like to just uh, flag up is the fact that I think, while there is this thing in inverted commas of the shared economy, Uber and all these, these new phenomena, I think it's really important to underline the reality that sharing within societies, cross-culturally and across all ages and walks of life is not, not a new phenomenon. And in this country, um, uh, I remember in the, um, after the war, my, my parents, who were very young and ran a, a theatre group, were making plays um, and making everything themselves in a context of great deprivation where there was nothing. They were creating th uh, culture from the ground up. But I think that people of all ages, uh, whether they're my parents' age now, they're in the 80s and late 80s, this ethos of sharing is, is something that people of all ages have. It's just that we've become conditioned to think otherwise. And I think uh, that's something I'd like to stress because mm. I think that has to be the forefront of projects uh, that that, that it, uh, people like Irina are flagging up. Do you, do you not agree? Well, I would, yeah. I mean, I would agree. Um, essentially, sharing is something that, as with many other things, is sic it, it's secular and that it, it goes through phases where one thing rises to prominence and then another. Um, and to give something that ties into that, obviously in the med medieval period and prior to that, we, uh, we were makers. I mean, yes, we had master builders and we had experts per se, um, even they were multitaskers, but you know your your average homeowner would be very efficient at things like you know a bit of carpentry, a bit of sewing, a bit of this and that. Um, then of course we had the industrial revolution, which is it's we've experienced it. We're coming out the back end of it, if you like. But in some parts of the world, obviously like China, they're sort of they're entering the, the phase that we were in some time ago now. And essentially we outsourced stuff and we started to accumulate and we started to hoard and we started to expect and legislate for a lot more space. Um, but now we're, we're at a stage when actually we're becoming makers again. And it's obviously not just the whole 3D printing thing. We've got a huge culture that has is, that is re-emerged and it's everything from the, the Women's Institute getting younger members to all sorts of clubs popping up. The idea of instead of having a gym membership, you have a local crafts uh, community centre membership and you go there and you, you, know, you hang out and you make and you learn. Um, it's all really sort of coming back to the fore in this particular part of the world and it's being facilitated in new ways. So we're seeing a rise again. But then again, if we juxtapose that, yes, inherently they, they do have a lot of sharing uh, culture in many other parts of the world. But as I said, they're experiencing things that we went through. So if you look at China, you've got a very consumption-led culture. So absolutely, it's, it's uh, to, to quote Gibson, the future is apparently distributed. I think all things, in a sense, are distributed. Um, but I was, I was very much speaking from our experience in the West of the sharing culture. Mike, I was interested in the work that you're doing on design in terms of how much of that, how much of a city's identity 
are you pulling out of its past and its history? And how much are you trying to shape its future? Um, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> past is incredibly important. Mm. Um, we all take root from things in the past, be it memories, experiences, all those sorts of things. There's also the notion of self and, and, and difference, this idea that we're unique and individuals, with the idea there's a collective spirit and a collective mm. identity, mm. a collective meaning for things. And those are, those are very much about tensions. I think, I mean, as a designer, it's very easy to say, I can design everything in, an Im in my own image. And I, I think the big thing for designers is actually about letting go as well. Right. And actually about, um, as I said, about that curating. I see a design process more in a curatorial role. Mm where you actually have the ability as a designer to engage others in that experience and open that up. So, you know, a design should be an open and cathartic right. process, not a close and not a based on an ideology per se. And I think that that's a tension because, um, you know, I'm very wary of I am designers. Yeah. I mean, you know, yes. Yeah, just like some, Charles is very wary of these heroic planners. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I think if you can create open <laughs> processes and dialogue, mm -hmm. um, then you have more chance of rooting right. a, a multiplicity of different interests, different yeah. viewpoints and whatever. Obviously, you know, planning your way through some level of consensus can be quite, sure. be quite no, difficult, <laughs> but that's, that's part and parcel of what makes life so interesting. Right. Other questions? Um, hello. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Um, this is more like a comment for um, Irene. Uh, or Charles, maybe. Um, I'm interested in the concept of resilience, and it seems to me that it's always um, related to something positive. Uh, but there are lots of criticisms um, against, like, the resilience uh, theory. Um, how would you address those criticisms? And I would like to, yeah, know your views about it. Thank you. Irana, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I, I know the main criticism is that it's been taken over by politicians and called localism. So, you know, the, the, main, the main criticism is that it's a way of devolving power from <coughs> those who, who democratically have been, have been given the power by, by the people and pushing their responsibility for service delivery to people who can least uh, uh, help themselves. So this is the big criticism, that it's a, it, it has become a a policy, it has been um, you know, uh, basically uh, taken over by uh, po politicians and slightly turned on its head. But I'm looking at many other criticisms of, uh, of resilience. I think there is implication resilience that we will be going through some very difficult times and because it, we are in such a denial about it. You know, sustainability, sustainability implies that we can get into this very beautiful world where everything's going to be all right. Resilience implies that actually we have to withstand some very big shocks on the <coughs> way. And we are not able to cope with the amount of um, scary stuff that's going out there. We, we are in denial of all of this, you know, including what's happening on the borders of, of Europe at the moment and in Paris. Uh, and keep, keep avoiding the issues. So resilience yeah. keeps implying that we will have to adapt and we will have some hard times. And I think that's part of the fear around the world. The world. Charles, in the only work that you've do been doing, you know, what yeah, are Only a tiny doing point because uh, mm. obviously you want other questions. I think one of the issues about resilience, it is a slightly defensive word rather than one mm -hmm. that makes you feel you are an actor <coughs> yourself. Mm. That, that's one of the main things that I, I mm. would comment on about that. The other danger, of course, it's like sustainability. We didn't really know what it meant. Okay, let's now always use the word. A slogan then can hollow out, but we know that. They use it enough and it goes back to being meaningless. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, other questions from hello, the Hello, good morning. Yeah. Hi, hello, hi. Um, uh, so I'm an artist and I'm interested in change making. And I was interested, Irena and Bradley, in finding a way to bring together two of your points. One which was, um, hi, over here. Hello, hi. Um, hello. Um, so you say to work with the city councils as collaborator, and I absolutely agree with you. And then Bradley, you're also talking about sort of completely doing away with the idea of permission. And I was wondering what what's the flavour of that tension when you are trying to do away with permission and you need to work with the city <laughs> city council? And have there been any times where you've come across a moment like that and you've actually found a strategy to be able to bring the council on on board? to do away with the very permissions that they need to grant you? 
Mm. Bradley, do you want to take that, please? Yeah, um, so I don't mean to take a totally adversarial position here. You know, as I said, very often the councils are put in an uncomfortable position where they're being pressured um, to push through particular policies that they don't necessarily agree with. And I understand that, you know, in, in, as part of this process, when they're negotiating multiple stakeholders, they've, you know, they're in a very difficult position. Um, and my first starting point would always be to work with the council or work with local partners um, if possible. What I'm saying is that if that fails, that shouldn't stop you from doing what you want to do, right? That you should just carry on with it. And I guess I would push that a little bit further and say that, you know, sometimes you need to try and read ahead on those positions. And if you realize that it's going to be easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, then, uh, you know, again, I think you should just carry on. Because the difficulty is we spend so much time speculating and negotiating that we don't actually get on with projects that change the city in a meaningful way. Um, but I think, yeah, where, where you can work with the council, you should, absolutely. Um, you mentioned technology in smart cities, and I just wanted to um, ask the question about the ethics behind that. Um, I was recently at a conference for local authority people, and there was a presentation by Marshalls, who create a lot of street furniture, and they were presenting on their sort of like technological advances, and it's things like lights that might uh, light up a bit brighter for people uh, with visual impairments. Um, and seats that opened up for people that you know required access to a seat, and you know I think some of that's really positive, but also it seems to be sort of designing people out of street furniture and who gives permission for you to use this seat and who gives you the tag. And I just thought um, it was kind of interesting that there's there's some issues of uh, ethics and democracy that are not being raised in these technological advances. I mean, the, the thing I would say in response to that is we have a fantastic session at the end of today <laughs> at 5.30, which is specifically addressing that. And one of the speakers there is Evgeny Morozov, who I think you find will ask a lot of hard questions about how we're using cities to enrich the experience, but also perhaps to control the experience of citizens in their own environment. So I hope you can make that. I hope others can make it. Thank all of our um, panelists and our audience for a great session, and I hope to see you at further sessions in the course of today. I think most of the speakers will be hanging around the bar for some of the morning if you'd like to come and talk to them, um, and if you have further questions that you'd like to put to them personally. Thanks so much. Thank you.